being a brand founder is just like the most stressful thing in the world. And then layer on top of it, growth, an already stressful thing becomes an incredibly stressful thing. Talk about personal finance. What has everyone been saying for like, like the last year and a half? Don't hold on to cash because it's going to go down in value. Opportunities come to those who have cash. How has it been working with Mark Cuban? Hey, what's up, John? How's it going today? How are you? I'm good, man. I'm a little tired. I was at this Triple Whale event the last couple of days. It was, uh, it was a lot to take in, but it was really awesome. That's epic. I wish I could have made that event. I saw that it was, uh, it was pretty sick and, and uh, was trying to book it in my travel schedule, but had a, had a couple other things going on. But to just want to introduce you real fast, uh, thanks for coming on the show today. For everyone out there, we've got John Blair with free to go CFO. And John, you want to give us a little background on you and your company and kind of where you're at? Yeah, for sure. So I guess um, I'll go back a little bit to kind of the earlier days of my career and how I got to this point. Um, you know, I originally got into business. Um, yeah, my first exposure to the business world was deciding to go to business school at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which obviously is actually how I know you um, through a fellow business, uh, a fellow business school, um, cohort of, of mine. And, um, you know, ultimately I went to business school, not knowing exactly what I wanted to get into, but knowing I wanted to be an entrepreneur of, of some sort. I've always been very entrepreneurial. When I was a kid, I started my own skateboard company when I was like eight years old, making my own stickers out of clear tape and, and Avery printer labels. Um, spray painting my own decks with, you know, uh, uh, different designs, always very entrepreneurial, always the leader of the pack, getting groups of kids to come together to do crazy things like go build bike jumps or do uh, create like uh, our own skateboard contest and with prizes and stuff like that. And so I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't know what I wanted to concentrate in, but I'm like, I'm going to business school. So got to Cal Poly year two. I took to accounting originally. I, I took my first accounting class and was like, it just made sense to me. I don't know how to explain it other than that. It just made sense to me. And so I decided to declare um, to be an accounting concentration and um, realized really quickly that the accounting program is all geared towards trying to groom you to become uh, a member of a big four accounting firm, you know, an, an employee of everyone goes and gets the internship at, ENY or Grant Thornton. And, um, you know, they use that as a hiring funnel to ultimately suck you into working there. I was the rebel. I didn't do any of that. Um, I just continued to go through business school, trying to figure out what it was I wanted to do next. And my entrepreneurial journey really started when I was introduced to a guy named Ron Merritt, who was a local entrepreneur in San Luis Obispo. He was also a guest lecturer. Um, his claim to fame, he was on Forbes uh, magazine cover a number of years ago because he had invented this and patented the, the concept of DVD players in the back of headrests of cars, but not installed. He had this video traveler that Velcroed around the headrest. He patented that thing, got it spun up in China, imported it all himself, sold to Costco and a lot of uh, big box stores and just killed it. And a big company big Fortune 500 company in Fridge on his patent. And this little guy went to court against them and won, got on the cover of Forbes magazine and kind of that was his claim to fame. So anyways, he was really, um, really well known in the Cal Poly business community because of being a guest lecturer. And he was also a part of the Cal Poly's Innovation Quest, which is kind of like a business plan competition every year. And so I got introduced to him through a friend in business school because he was looking for a bookkeeper for his latest business. And that was when I was, a, I think it was the end of my third year of college. So I still had two years left in school and I started working as a bookkeeper for this local entrepreneur. Turns out that it was bookkeeper and everything else. I was logistics manager, customer service manager, marketing manager. And it was just like, I was his right hand doing everything that he didn't want to do or couldn't do. And he was just a, he taught me, he, he always told me, John, listen, don't waste your time working for giant companies. I've done it before. It's terrible. It sucks the soul out of you. Like it just is no fun. He's like, all you got to do is figure out how to solve a problem 
you can always be thinking about solving problems, you're going to make it on your own, right? And he showed me firsthand how to solve problems in the marketplace and get people to pay you for it. He was a former, former electrical engineer. And so he would just find these little niche products. I'll give you a quick example. Nothing sexy. At, uh, this was uh, back in like 2007. So projector TVs were, um, that technology was kind of big because that was a way to get like a big, you know, projected like, you know, movie or video game, but, but uh, actual screen TVs hadn't fully caught up to that yet, right? And so he found this hole in the market where no one was making a $200 projector that was really easy to use that like an older person could use really easily, right? It was all geared towards like the techies. So he went and as electrical engineer designed his own little $200 projector went to china sourced the manufacturer started bringing containers over and selling a bunch of it himself partially direct to consumer on his own website and then partially through like uh, uh other retailers that cater to that demographic like qvc right another uh, old magazine catalog called heartland america and so anyways i was all exposed to this in my last two years of, of school and that's when i got the entrepreneurial bug and as fate would have it he was a judge in this thing called Innovation Quest, which was effectively a business plan competition. Well, a guy named Brian Riley had invented this prototype um, of a brake system for bicycles that prevents you from flipping over handlebars. Well, Ron, my boss at the time, was the judge for that year's Innovation uh, Quest contest, and Brian Riley's braking system won the contest. And so, the day after Innovation Quest, my boss, Ron, comes in the office and is like, John, there's this kid who goes to business school with you. His name's Brian Riley. You got to meet him. He invented the coolest bike break. Like, it's going to blow up. It's going to be the next big thing. I'm taking them to Taiwan, and I'm going to introduce them to Trek and Specialized. And anyways, he's like, they need a bookkeeper. So he introduces me to Brian, and lo and behold, that was the start of what's become kind of like the cornerstone of my professional experience, which was being on the founding team of a company called Guardian Bikes. And so fast forward a couple of years, I'm working as a bookkeeper nights and weekends. Well, funny enough, I graduate from Cal Poly. I take a break from trying to go full time into the professional world to play in a heavy metal band because I started a metal band with a, a thrash metal band with a bunch of, yeah, yeah, with the guy who introduced me to you, right? And so a bunch of friends from business school, we were all metalheads and we started a band like year two or year three and we just stayed together, kept playing, kept practicing, playing local shows, Frog and Peach, we blew away Frog and Peach downtown, a um, couple other small joints downtown and event, we got signed to a record label and we we're like, okay, well, I don't know if we're that good, but might as well give it a shot, right? And so looking back on it, actually, I call that, that was a part of my entrepreneurial journey as well. Like starting a band, getting signed and trying to make it in the music world is as entrepreneurial as it gets. Like, Yeah, it's building a brand, right? From the ground up. 100%. And so I spent the next two years recording a record, going on some small tours, playing a lot locally. If anyone listening is a metalhead, our biggest claim to fame uh, was opening for a band called Fear Factory um, in San Diego. And we did actually get nominated as like hard rock band of the year to like the San Diego Music Awards. Uh, we didn't win. But um, all the while, I was still moonlighting doing accounting and finance for Guardian Bikes on nights and weekends. Eventually, I was like, okay, heavy metal doesn't pay the bills. It was a lot of fun. I don't regret the experience at all, but I decided to get back in the accounting and finance world. And so I started taking various jobs, working as controller, head of finance, all for um, emerging brands that were in various industries. I worked, uh, I started first really heavily in the manufacturing world. And what was great about that is that it just really got me in tune with how products are made like what drives cost in a product before you even before you even get it in the door and it's like sellable, right? I actually worked as the controller in a factory that was in uh, Costa Mesa, California. And 
walking out onto the factory floor and seeing how raw materials come in and get you know transferred in the machine shop and then sent to a plating shop and then from there to assembly i was really able to cut my teeth on like how to manage inventory and how inventory drives cost and cash flow and so i was immediately i, I got kind of i became known as the controller like this weird or not weird I got really close with everyone who wasn't in the accounting department. Like I was the go-to for all the people on anywhere on the manufacturing floor. Hey, John, I need your help with this. And I oftentimes couldn't be found at my desk because I was on the factory floor helping solve a problem. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because it really turned me into this very operationally focused accountant, right? Is that like I'm, I'm managing the numbers but I'm managing what is driving those numbers. So anyways, during that time, I'm still working for Guardian Bikes. I went on to a couple more full-time um, controller and or head of finance jobs. And at the same time, Guardian had been trying to get on Shark Tank. And it's a long process getting approved. I think it took 18 months to go through all the steps. And uh, around the time that Brian and his other co-founder, Kyle, we're getting ready to actually get called to the set. I was looking at trying to find something new. I'd kind of got, I'd worked at several fast growing businesses and none of them were just quite as entrepreneurial as I wanted them to be. And I was looking for something like super entrepreneurial. Well, again, as fate would have it, uh, Brian and Kyle close the deal on set with Mark Cuban, take a 500 K investment. And they tell me like, Hey man, as soon as the money comes in, we want to hire you full time. So that was back in 20, 15, 2016, um, come on board full time. We uh, launched Guardian Bikes as the safest kids, uh, ki safest kids bike featuring our sure stop brakes that prevent you from flipping over the handlebars, 100% direct to consumer e-com play, which is was thought of as crazy in the bike industry. Everyone in the bike industry is like, you can't sell bikes online. Everyone wants to feel it and sit on it and size themselves. We overcame all those barriers with series of like technology plays and process plays. And we scaled that from zero bikes to 60,000 bikes a year in just a few years. And during that time, I really cut my teeth on like, whoa, how capital intensive it is to scale a D2C CPG brand super fast and figuring out that relationship between like marketing spend, return on marketing spend, and then having to take cash, buy inventory, always having to buy more every year, right? to keep up and um, did that for several years. And then about nine months ago, I was feeling the itch to like really start my own thing. And I had built this great network of uh, over my years at Guardian and just a, a bunch of skills on the finance and ops side. Um, and just started kind of putting feelers out of my network and really quickly started getting bites on like a fractional CFO offering. And I knew one thing, I knew that like, I wanted to start a company that really cares for people and I wanted to fight back against how overwhelming it is for founders to scale and feel very like not confident in the decisions they're making. I wanted to solve that problem. And so I started Free to Grow CFO uh, as a fractional CFO business for fast growing D2C CPG brands, focusing on giving the insights and analytics that brand owners need to scale and make fast decisions confidently. And that's where I am today. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. John, and you know, it's it's so wild for me to hear the story of Guardian because I was actually fraternity brothers with Brian. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. And remember, remember hearing the story of him being like, <laughs> yeah, I'm starting this brake startup. It's like, we're gonna take the same idea of a car with ABS system and apply it, apply it to, to brakes on bikes. And we're gonna build it and to just see the growth of them over the years and where they've gone is like, it's it's really, really inspiring to see. And they've like a full commitment to doing this for over a decade. Yes, yeah, I um, we sat down with a lender one time to pitch them on lending us some money and the owner of the, of the, the lender was like, how long have you guys been doing this for? And at that time it was nine years. Brian goes nine years. And he's like, dude, you're crazy, but I love this. Yeah, that's awesome. Super cool. So um, tell us a little bit more about uh, free to go CFO right now. Kind of what are you guys doing and um, 
and how do you guys help brands? Yeah, so you know, free to grow CFO, like first off, like the the whole ethos behind it is really delivering a service that really shows care for brand founders. Being a brand founder is just like the most stressful thing in the world. And then layer on top of it, growth, an already stressful thing becomes an incredibly stressful thing, right? And and honestly, that's the origination of our name is like free to grow, right? We want our the founders we work with to experience freedom and growth at scale and our services help provide that, right? So the nuts and bolts of what we do is monthly financial statement analysis, strategic planning, forecasting and projections, and cash strategy and fundraising. Um, I don't know how much of detail you want me to go into each one of these. We have a whole playbook that we follow, but those that's like the core of what we do. What do you think is the is the thing that most sub million brands need? Sub million a month brands need. Um I, undoubtedly the the single biggest thing they need is to understand cash and how it's different than profit and um understanding how to forecast and plan cash and really most most brands that i that i encounter whether we end up working together or not don't even have a cash plan and the few that do they have a cash plan that is way too granular and way too cumbersome to maintain so they start it and then they can't keep up as the business rapidly changes the key is to stay laser focused on the key drivers of cash flow. And there's only a few for a CPG brand, but there are a few huge drivers, right? It marketing spend and return on marketing and inventory purchases. Those are and and there's a there's a there's a sneaky little link between the two of those, right? If you're not selling enough, but you bought but you bought to sell more, you're gonna be stuck with inventory and have cash tied up. If you didn't buy enough and you're getting a really good return on your ad spend and you're scaling your ad spend, you're going to stock out and you're going to leave money on the table. And so focusing on that relationship and making sure there's always enough cash to execute the inventory purchasing and the ad spend functions is by far the biggest problem I encounter. I couldn't agree anymore from being on the marketing side. Yeah, for sure. Working, working with brands. It's like there's that fine line between overbuying and turning your warehouse into a bank with just dollars on the shelves. And then having those light speed, you know, time frames where it's like we have six weeks to three months where things are just working so well with return on ad spend, acquisition of new customers product market fit, virality, repeat return, you know, repeat customer rates where you just have to double down the, through those times. So it's, it's forecasting for both, for both of those. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing that accentuates it, seasonality really accentuates that challenge that much more. And, and, you know, that's guardian bikes. My experience there, it was like the ultimate test of, figuring out how to manage those those variables of cash flow inventory purchasing marketing spend because cpg like consumer products in general have a seasonality because of like just consumer spending changes throughout the year but then bikes have even more accentuated peaks and valleys because no one buys bikes in the in the winter when it's cold they buy it all in the spring and summer and then not again right before the holidays and then crazy in the holidays. And so, like you said, you have these short windows. Like we actually figured out at Guardian that during the holidays one year, over a six week period, we did 50% of our revenue for the whole year. And that's like, you mess up that six weeks and that's your whole year. And so the care that goes into the, the purchasing, the ad spend plan and the cash flow during that time is just like, it's painstaking. Also making sure you have the right people on the team during those six weeks and then make sure they've been planning for the last 12, right? To get ready for it because, you know, one person takes their foot off the gas or it doesn't have their head in the game and it's, 
showing up to play with, uh, with, uh, with the wrong team or the wrong resources. Totally. And you know what, you bring up a good point because I would say that by far, even though we do financial statement analysis, strategic planning and fundraising, we spend most of our time with our clients on forecasting and projections, not because the numbers that we forecast are always right. Rule number one of forecasting is your forecast is wrong. It's the, it's the act of planning, right? And getting a group of people together to plan and say like, hey, to make this number happen, we would have to do this and this and this. And if this doesn't pan out, would we be able to survive if this or this or this happens? And do we have the right people? Do we have the right creative that's ready to roll? Do we have, right? And so it's, we spend a lot of time actually as a, the result of forecasting and projections and the, and the process, the, the recurring process we put in place, the result ends up being that our clients learn how to plan. And that's actually the most valuable thing. I, once again, I'm saying I, I can't agree anymore because on our side, on the retention front, it's the same with us. We we're planning out campaigns, you know, 30, 60, 90 days in advance. And, you know, I have to say for, for a lot of these, you know, I'm sure it's similar to you. A lot of these smaller brands are like shooting, you know, they're, they're shooting as fast as they can. Right. And for them to stop and plan is difficult. And it's like a paradigm shift that needs to evolve in their thinking because they're like, I got here by just throwing a bunch of shit on the wall. <laughs> and it's like, if you're going to, if you're going to go where you want to go, you have to evolve because the things you did to get where you're at today are not what's going to get you to where you want to go tomorrow. It's the same thing. Like for us, you, you talk about that six week window, you know, we started planning out holiday and Black Friday back in June. And then we presented everything to our clients at the end of July and early August and started working in campaigns in September. And I, you know, in some of, in some of our workspaces with our clients, it's like, I can go back and see, we need to get this approved. We need to get this approved. We need to get this approved months in advance. And it's like, it's, it's a, you know, I feel like the roles we're in is a lot of business coaching as well. Even though we're done for you services, there's coaching to just change the paradigm in the, in the, in the mindset of the business owner and the founder, you know, to, to let them know planning is essential. If you don't plan on all aspects of your business, you're waking up every day, like, like a chicken without a head running around trying to herd cats. And if we're doing that, you're losing. 100%. It's funny that you mentioned that because that's something that I have, I've only been at this on the, you know, free to grow CFO side, the consulting side of the table for nine months now. And one thing that I'm really starting to see clearly in the brands that were, were successfully helping is that there, this coaching aspect you speak of, yeah, we have output that we give them. We have deliverables we give them, but what actually is helping them the most is they're actually putting some process and systematization in place that they didn't have before, right? And it's like, like they start running off a system. Like we have the same meetings every single week. We review the same KPIs. We use these thresholds to make decisions, right? Whereas before it was just kind of like founder and his ad buyer would talk and be like, hey, do we need to kill that? Like, do we need to crank that? Do we need to do that? And now it's like, well, you got operations who's ordering inventory and finance who's looking at cash flow in the same meeting. And we're making a lot of those decisions about what to do with marketing with all those people at the table. But there's a process. We come together every week and we look at the same things. And, and so anyways, the, the process that gets put in place, the framework is actually one of the most important things. Yeah. And I think that you bring up an interesting point too, why when when you're like i said sub million a month brand you know at the you know high six seven figure run rate you know it's it's tough to hire for specific roles because if someone doesn't have the direct experience of actually building the systems and the process and you just think you can hire someone with experience to do this one thing they're not necessarily prepared to implement properly versus hiring you you're like this is the system here's the process this is what we're doing 
There's no other way to do it, right? Yeah, it's it, 100%. Like I've realized recently that um, where we sit in terms of like where we're, where we're really valuable to the brand is that point in time when you need a CFO, you need CFO expertise and you need systems on the finance side of your business, but you cannot afford like a 20 to 30K a month full-time CFO but your bookkeeper doesn't cut it. They don't know these things. A lot of times, if you even have like a controller, they don't know these things, right? And Or an accountant whose main priority is really just handling tax. 100%. Another one that I hear all the time is brands will have like a mentor or someone with like that's business experience in another field and they trust this person and they're coming in to try to make financial decisions for a D2C business and they've never done anything in D2C before. So they're like the worst person to talk to because when you're dealing with buys in media and resources, like you said, cash flow is king. It is the number one thing that will make or break the business every single day. There's profitable businesses that have no cash all over the place. Um, a lot more than you think, and actually even a lot of, of brands that are a lot bigger than you think. I'm talking brands doing 50 to 100 million a year in revenue that don't have their finance game together. And the, you know, I, there's a, a book that I recently read called Simple Numbers. And the, the guy who wrote it has this quote that he keeps saying over and over throughout the book. It really hit hard with me. He says, opportunities come to those who have cash, right? And and it's it's totally right. Is that like, if you want to be opportunistic and you want to capitalize on opportunities, you've got to have cash in the bank or access to cash somehow, right? If you don't have, I mean, a recession is a perfect example. Most people don't profit off of a recession because they don't have access to cash in a recession. But the ones that do, the opportunities just fall into their lap, right? I, you couldn't, I couldn't have said it better myself too. You, I'm sure, you know, just talk about personal finance. What has everyone been saying for like, like the last year and a half? Don't hold on to cash because it's going to go down in value. It's like those same people that told you to put money in the stock market in crypto. <laughs> They're not talking right now, right? Yeah. Well, and, and you know, it's, 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 let's, let's, spin it to like a D to C example. And from like a marketing perspective, you know, there's a science behind uh, direct to consumer marketing, but sometimes things happen that you just don't anticipate and you have this upside opportunity all of a sudden. And if you don't have cash sitting there, you don't have cash available, you can't take advantage of it. I mean, something, something similar happened to guardian bikes um, during the pandemic when bike demand just took off. Um, what, what happened widespread across the industry? People ran out of bikes, right? All of our competitors ran out of bikes and one of our, our bikes during COVID. Yeah. Yeah. And the, all, the only other like real premium direct to consumer kids bike brand, um, that we considered our major competitor, they were out of bikes for like six months and we, we cleaned up shop. We, we, we stole a bunch of their customers just by virtue of us being able to have we had cash to keep buying inventory and our, and our factory was able to deliver, right? And so there are things that come up all the time. And if you don't have access to capital, then, then you can't take advantage of it. And that's, so another thing that we do, the, I would say the other side of that cash management coin that we really focus on is access to non-dilutive capital. Um, so that you can take advantage of opportunities because here's the reality of, of a CPG business. Uh, you're inventory based. And if you're growing every new inventory purchase or every new inventory buy, unfortunately always has to be bigger than the previous one and it's not sold yet. Right. And you could be making great marketing ROIs. Um, and, but you always have to buy more today than, than you need today. And so when it's really easy to get upside down on cash and be super profitable when you're growing a CPG business. So, um, you know, we have amassed a network of lenders that 
are, are uh, that focus on the D to C space. Like they love it. They get the economics. They understand the cash gap. And so what we'll do is we'll bring in the right lenders for that particular business's size and growth trajectory and industry. And we'll help plug the cash flow gap with, um, you know, revolving lines of credit so that especially if you have a seasonal business, you can afford to load up on the inventory and keep cranking on ad spend or whatever it is that you need to do to capitalize on opportunities like the six week window for the holiday season, right? And then pay that money back with all of your profit and beyond to the next year. And so we spend a lot of time once we understand the cash flow situation and the growth strategy for a brand going and finding the right debt partners to come um, uh, to come provide seasonal capital to the business. Are there any like, I'm, I'm curious, are you guys using any of these debt partners like Wayflyer right now with your clients? I'm curious what you think about those. Yeah. I do not like them at all. Um, I've, I've tried working with them before and uh, them as a company are, are great. In fact, I've met one of the founders of Wayflyer when they first like raised their first big round. He was the one doing all the sales. Really nice guys, super smart guys. I think they're from Ireland. They have cool accents. They sound pretty rad when you talk to them on the phone. Um, but the problem is, uh, and this is actually something that a lot of these, here's where they've excelled. They make underwriting super easy. You just plug in your QuickBooks and your Shopify and a couple other things and you get underwritten immediately, right? So they remove all the, the barrier to entry of like going for a revolving line of credit and going through like multi-week like underwriting process. So they remove that barrier. But what most brand founders don't understand is that let's say they give you a $300,000 advance, you only have $300,000 the day that you borrow that money and every day after that, you have less because they start taking a rev share. It's essentially like a bank loan. Here's the problem for growing brands. This is the real kicker. This is why we can never use them at Guardian. They underwrite on your history, your sales, sales history, right? So they calculate a percentage payback based on historical sales. But if I'm doubling my revenue, I'm on my way to doubling revenue, I pay that loan back so fast, so much faster than they have in their underwriting model that I had that money for a second, basically. But they still charge you a fixed fee up front. And so actually most brand founders don't realize the effective interest rate ends up being like 30, 40, 50% annualized when you do the math. So it's like, don't use them unless you can pay it back in like a couple weeks or a month. Right? It, it actually, the, the, it's counterintuitive to, in some ways to a lot of people is that you want to pay it back slow because because they charge you a fixed fee. So like, let's say it's a $5,000 fee. You want to you wanna pay them back as slowly as possible so that that $5,000 fee covers as long of a period of time. The faster you pay it back, the, the higher the annualized effective rate. And so I don't like it because when you're growing, you pay it back too fast. The capital doesn't stay in the business long enough. And there are other solutions out there where you can have more capital availability and a much lower cost of capital. I'm curious, what are what are those solutions look like? Is that building like good relationships with your bank directly, or if it's outsourced outsourced financing, other other types of financing options? The problem with banks, like true banks, a lot of them still don't get D to C. Uh, they're just light years behind, and. Um, the problem with the problem for a lot of DDC brands is they're new, their growth trajectories, like when they're growing are massive and they don't have a lot of history. And most of the banks like three years of like history on a tax return, right? Which, which most DDC brands don't have when they're, when they're growing super fast. So that kind of nixes like banks off of, off of the map. What there is are these non-bank lenders there's several out there that we that you know I've developed really great relationships with over the years and they've they've niched down to primarily focus on lending to D2C and they're filling that gap like you don't they don't underwrite on tax returns they underwrite on cash flow and and or an asset base and when I say an asset base that means like I can actually take a brand that's losing a little money or is just breaking even and I can go get them a loan because their inventory is looked at, is seen by these lenders as something that's available to secure a loan. So they'll give them a percentage of that as, as a drawdown. Very cool. I'm curious, what type of rates are these, are these uh, loans going for? 
So it depends on multiple factors, but I'd say like range wise, you're looking at typically all in, including all fees and everything. It that typically like low, low, low to high teens. And I know that's kind of like a, a wide range, but it just, it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on how much of the capital you use, how risky you are in terms of like how profitable or unprofitable you are, but you can usually get 13 to 19%, let's say. Also, another question for you. Now we're talking about financing and I'm curious on question for you. What is the best credit card for a D to C brand to be using for their paid media? If you're spending 50 grand, 150, 200 grand a month, what would you recommend? What a pain point, man, with every brand that I work with that's scaling. I've got one brand right now that is literally spending 2 million a month on Facebook with a two and a half row as, and we're, we are the founders complaining about their credit card constantly. I, to be honest with you, I think this is an area that's ripe for disruption. Amex at one point used to be the go-to, but they have really changed over recent years with like, they claim to have these cards that are no limit but all of a sudden your Facebook account will just stop because they've cut off the credit card at this phantom limit and force you to make a payment. And so at one point I would rec have recommended the no limit Amex cards, but I keep running into problems with them over and over again. There are other solutions like Brex um, that are, Brex is pretty good because they're very transparent about what your limit actually is. Um, but it can be hard to get as much of a credit limit as Amex claims to give you. Um, and then there's another, there's, have you ever heard of Dashfy? I have, I've heard of Dashfy and there's also Parker too. That's I've heard of, that's been getting some popularity. Have you heard of them? I haven't heard of them. I've, I'm in the middle of diligence with a client and on Dashfy. And the thing that's appears to be a little wonky about Dashfy is that they actually do take the, a security interest and they tie up some cash as collateral. And so depending on your situation, it may not be doable, but I will tell you like the, the short answer is that this is still a huge problem out there that I have not seen adequately solved, especially when you start getting in the situation where you're spending seven figures a month, it, it is a huge pain point. Now I will say this, uh, our VP of the VP of marketing for that client, I was talking to him about how I showed him an analysis of like, Hey, listen, man, literally this is how much cash is coming out of the business by us not being able to finance all of our ad spend until the credit card statement closes. And it was like, a, it was like a million dollars, right. That, that was coming out of our bank account too early. So he went to meta and he negotiated with them net 30 day payment terms. You have to be a big, spender you got to be a big account and actually have an ad, ad account rep that's got some pull yeah exactly but you can when you get to that point you can actually get net 30 day terms and that is a huge cash unlock i mean what we just got that that's literally no joke on average daily balance value that's going to put a million dollars back into the company which is just like i mean that's just a huge number and another question for you, what, what is, how has it been working with like Mark Cuban in, in, you know, that, that, uh, that investment with, with uh, guardian bikes and just working in his environment. So working with Mark was surprising in a number of ways. Like I'll say, first off, he's incredibly responsive and he owns so many different companies. He owns like, he owns dozens of shark tank companies he owns dozens of non-shark tank companies he does all of his work through his gmail account and he literally responds to every single email um that you send him and i mean he'd send us emails at one o'clock in the morning central time and um you know he's not gonna get in the you have to be really strategic with mark that you've got to give him like an executive summary right like he's on his phone He's smashing through tons of emails. He's not, you can't give him all the details, but if you set up a problem or a dilemma, he'll weigh in. And if he has someone in his network that he thinks you should talk to, he'll just CC them and be like, talk to this guy. I think he can help you. And so there were several things he, he 
helped us pivot on throughout the life of Guardian Bikes. I mean, one, we were sure stop brakes before Guardian Bikes. And he was the one that was like, no, dude, let's do We had this idea of Guardian Bikes and going direct to consumer with our own brand instead of being a brake company. And he really gave us the confidence to do that. In fact, hooked us up with some really high ups at, at Amazon to get started on Amazon Vendor Central. And that kind of helped launch the brand at the very beginning through a, what was that program called? Launchpad, Amazon Launchpad. I don't know if that's still around or not. But um, so he was... He think of him as like a really high level strategic advisor and um and just like an like he would plug us in if he had someone he can plug us into. And even after I left, they reached out to me after I left and and you know wished me the best of, of luck and thought that the problem that I, that free to grow CFO is trying to solve was like a huge problem. And and um John Simon, who's like the managing director of the fund that runs their Shark Tank companies, was like, Hey man. You're our go-to fractional CFO for any uh, portfolio companies who need help. And I've actually already worked with one. Um, and so it's just really, really cool, man. Mark is a, is a solid dude. I've met him in person twice. And just like, you know, he's so, when you hear him talk, it's like, I, obviously this guy's a billionaire. He's like a business genius. But when you see him in person, he's just the dude is what I always tell people. I mean, he rolled in the Mavs headquarters with just like some like workout sweats and a t-shirt, broken hand with a cast on it. And was like, what's up, dudes? Um, really, really awesome guy. And just willing to, I mean, dude, people will pitch him to his email, like cold pitch him and he responds. Wow. Yeah. He's crazy. So cool. That, I mean, I'm sure that's just been an incredible experience working with someone like that and, uh, and getting to just see high level how they operate and, uh, and make decisions daily. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. So let's, uh, let's talk a little about, I know at the beginning of the call, we were talking about that triple whale event you were just at, and I wish I could have made it as well. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about how tools like attribution tools like triple whale are helping you on the, on the CFO end of things. 100%. It's funny when I was at the event, I think I was the only like non ad or media buyer, VP of marketing, like creative director person there. And, and if several people were like, wow, you're here. I'm like, listen, man, for a D to C, my focus is D to C brands. I was on the brand side before this, like, if you don't understand your mark, if you don't understand what is driving the plane right through the sky, you don't understand anything. So if I'm looking at the numbers, uh, the financials, and I'm like, hey, we're not making money or we're not hitting our sales targets. Like if you don't understand what is going on with performance marketing, then you literally, I mean, you're just, you're, you're, you're doing a disservice to yourself and, and the brand that you're working for. And so you know, it does triple well and tools like it do a couple of things. One, just getting the, the data visibility quickly. Cause like back in the day when we first started scaling Guardian Bikes, there was not triple whale. It's like pulling, pulling down Excel spreadsheets from Amazon seller central and then pulling other ones from Shopify. And, you know, we built some of our own apps to marry up the data and like Tableau dashboards and stuff. And like just having that just populate. And even just like send you an automated Slack message every morning. Here is your performance overall. Here is your your marketing efficiency ratio for the company and then all the different channels. It's just incredibly huge because I'm, you know, when I'm looking at cash flow and per making performance, making decisions on how much advising operations, yeah, we can afford this much inventory, or like, yeah, we can crank up ad spend. I get asked those questions all the time. Like, John, can we afford to buy more inventory? Can we afford to crank up ad spend? I have to go look at the, I'm like, well, what is our MER looking like? I go look at those numbers so I can go, well, I see that our MER like really dropped throughout October and we've been assuming it's going to come back in November. The first four days in November, we are cranking, you know, and we're on pace from a daily perspective to hit 7 million in revenue. I'm like, yes, let's buy that inventory and let's keep cranking the spend. And so like, I have to understand those numbers or when people ask me that stuff, I'm, I would literally just be guessing. Totally. And it brings up another point where, you know, where you're just mentioning MER, media efficiency ratio. 
what's a healthy MER for a D to C brand that's doing like a hundred thousand to a half a million a month right now? What do you like to see as a, as a CFO? Let's say we had an AOV of somewhere between like, you know, a hundred to 125 bucks. Uh, we got a 75% margin on that. We've got a, you know, a CAC somewhere at around 35, 40, like, what uh what would you, what's a what's a healthy MER? So it's funny, I was having this conversation earlier today. Um it all depends on your gross margin and what I like to call your contribution margin before marketing. The higher that that percentage is, the higher you or the lower MER you can afford to take and still be a profitable business, right? And so like I have I have one client that's got an 80% gross margin. And their their other variable costs before marketing are only ten percent, so they've got seventy percent of margin before marketing. We can crank it a two mer, no no problems. But I have other brands that are like that sixty percent contribution margin before marketing is like forty, and like two mer will put us out of business, right? Like I probably need to see at least three, maybe even a little bit higher. And so it's funny because. I'm kind of starting to like develop this thesis that like, and I don't take this with a grain of salt. This is not, this is not universally true, but like if you can have a business where you just have like, if you can choose to sell products or differentiate and price your products such that you can have a killer gross margin, 70% or above, that is the key to scaling. Because you want to, if you want, if you have huge growth goals, like you want to get to hundreds of millions in revenue, you want to have the ability, I, I believe, to spend at a lower MER, like, and just capture scale and you can still be profitable, right? When you're dealing with 30, 40% margins, you can definitely still scale your brand. Like I've done, done it before, seen it before, but it makes everything so much harder, right? And, and, um, so the answer to your question, the, the, the higher your gross margin and ultimately your contribution margin before marketing spend is, the lower MER we can afford to take and still be a profitable business. Um, and it just kind of opens up the playing field, I believe, from a paid media standpoint to be able to capture more, more customers because you, you can actually live with a higher CAC and still be a profitable business. So it's situationable based on... The, the business's margin and cost structure. Totally. Speaking of that too, is there like a, it, do you also look at LTV to CAC as well when you guys, because you know, some brands are, might have a hero product on the front end, might not be as profitable in the front end, but, but LTV on that, on that customer could be very high on the, you know, the nature of the product, like consumables so forth 100 percent. and i was actually having this conversation yesterday at the triple well event with the vp of marketing for actually that conversation i was around just a bunch of marketers and that conversation was happening like the a whole two days and like it all comes down to what you understand about the relationship between one of your customers and their buying behavior over time so when i say that i mean i've got one brand who right now they've scaled from like zero to 4 million a month in revenue in 18 months, but everyone has only one product to buy. So looking at LTV to CAC does not make any sense right now, but the founder knows I better figure out how to get these people to buy something else later, or this brand is going to die. Eventually we're going to hit the ceiling, right? Absolutely. And so you always need to know it. You don't necessarily make spend decisions based on it, right? But if you do want to go the LTV to CAC route with making spending decisions, you've got to understand your payback period and how soon you finally become profitable on that customer because you've got to understand first order profitability versus lifetime profitability. And if there's too much of a gap between those two, those two time points, first order and reaching break even or profitable from a lifetime perspective, you better have enough cash in the bank to be able to make it to the point where you become profitable. So it really depends is the answer. But that's part of what we help brands understand is like, do we have the cash to be 
break even or lose money on the front end, you know, AOV over CAC on the first order, but get to LTV over CAC becomes profitable over time. Do we have enough capital to fill the gap? So, you know, we provide a lot of those, a lot of the cash flow forecasting that's needed to make those decisions. All right, John, one last question for you. Um, have, I'm curious, have you worked with any uh, D2C brands that are selling info products on the front end or any type of course related content that can essentially liquidate ad spend? I think, you know, the future with what I see with, with commerce is if you can be selling, you know, a front end product that is info based, right? And then you can convert customers into a membership or some type of, you know, physical goods. That's a model. I'm curious if you've seen anything like that. I haven't. So I have a brand who's testing that right now. Um, and I'm very interested in it as well. I recently listened, uh, the founder of that brand stumbled upon, uh, upon this podcast episode, uh, the future with Chris Doe. He's interviewing this guy named Daniel Priestley and he's talking about this product ecosystem. It's a fascinating concept. I highly recommend going and listening to this. Like, yeah, I love Chris Dell. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna check that out. Yeah, Daniel yeah. Priestley is his name, and the the concept of a product ecosystem is you have four stages of products. You have, you have, uh, what is it? Gifts, product for prospects, core offerings, and then your product for clients, right? And the gift is a, this podcast, blogs just content that people can just consume that's helpful, valuable, right? But like, doesn't, you, they can just engage with it however they want. The product for prospects can be like what you're talking about, like some sort of a course that doesn't cost that much, like maybe it's 20 bucks, 30 bucks, maybe 50, maybe it's 99. You acquire the customer through paid advertising, right? But then say after that, you, you know, it's a course about how to manage your cash flow, and then you sell them accounting, you know, fractional CFO light, which would be just like getting your books done, right? That's the core offering. But where you really make your profit is the product for clients, which is like free to grow CFO premium, right? You get your accounting done, your financial strategic planning, cash flow forecasting, fundraising. And so you almost think of splitting up your funnel almost into these stages of products. Right. And like, I'm fascinated by the concept. I'm definitely have aspirations to do that with my business. And it's something that I've been, I have one client who's testing this and I, I really like, it makes a lot of sense to me. And I think there's a lot of promise there. Yeah. I think the full Ascension ladder and just B2B and B2C customer acquisition is really going to see this as we move forward. We got a similar thing that we're working on as well right now um, on the, on the front end for, for our agency, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I know there's some niches, like, especially like in the, um, in like sewing and crochet and like, um, a lot of these types of, um, you know, DIY communities, there's a lot of opportunities there and people have really scaled info on the front end and then turned, you know, th those people into continuity members with membership and also selling physical goods. Yeah. 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 It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Cool. Well, John, I know we're wrapping up today, but thank you so much for coming on. And, uh, where can anyone find you? Like, uh, are you, are you guys on the socials is, uh, what's, it's your site. Where can people reach out to you after? Yeah. So website free to grow CFO.com. And you can find us on LinkedIn. A lot of uh, right now I'm mostly, uh, mostly on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me, Jonathan Blair, on LinkedIn, and Free to Grow CFO has a page as well. But we're we're putting out a lot of helpful tips um, on a weekly basis out there, and we've got an email list you can subscribe to to get weekly content that's helpful for scaling your business. And um, yeah, I appreciate you having me on, man. It was a blast talking to you. We'll have to do it again. Yeah. By the way, we'll put we'll put those links in the show notes as well, so they're there. So thanks, John. Appreciate it today.